Welcome to the Jerry Reynolds Show. Uh, guess what? I am Jerry Reynolds, and we are here at the McCreary Studio and the home of, as you well know, the finest uh, home furnishings in Sacramento. So uh, it's really a great thrill to be here and uh, doing another uh, interview podcast with a, a person I've known a long time, uh, and most of you in Sacramento, I'm sure, well aware of this gentleman, Mr. Jim Crandall. Yo, uh, I love your studio, by the way. It is nice, it's isn't awesome. it? awesome, yeah. And can I just say real quick, I, my wife, when I told her I was coming out here to McCreary's to do it, she doesn't care about you. Yeah. But she said, oh, McCreary's, maybe I'll go. She loves the store. She, When we were back in Wisconsin, she used to do uh, furniture sales and interior design and that kind of thing. She says this is the best store in Sacramento. So I, I didn't want her to come because I knew I'd go home with another sofa and we, <laughs> we have enough sofas yeah. but she loves she loves the store it's beautiful and your studio is outstanding I mean, well it's really good to nice. know that that she has great taste in some things uh, oh so, zing. so anyway but no it's great to that's have where you. we're gonna go yeah, no, no i you know you just set yourself up for that i did, I you, did you know yeah. you kind of came at me there yeah. a little bit you, you know didn't if, have if to. there's a shot to be had you shot. gotta go for it yeah exactly so uh but uh of course I think we go back a long ways. Uh, you know, of course, you were here slightly before yeah. I was uh, with the Kings, but this is my 35th year, so I guess you'd be... Yeah, in. I'm pretty close. I came in uh, the fall of 84, which was the Kings last year in Kansas City, and obviously the first year before, the last year before they, you know, finally came here. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and that was a super interesting time. Sure was, wasn't it? Yeah. You know, I, I, I did, you probably knew more about that situation than I did. I, I mean, really, because I was hired in July of that year. I always get blamed for drafts and joke line. I had what he <laughs> yeah, what he hired as that's, an assistant that's coach. One that's yet. not your fault. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I've, there's plenty of things that are. But he was that, a heck I, of a good guy, though. I, absolute best guy. Yeah, you heck know, of a I, good guy. You couldn't be, you couldn't beat him, and actually had a better career than. And a lot of yeah, guys. Yeah, no, he was in the league for a while. For yeah, yeah. I mean, he's not. He wasn't a star player, but, he, but he he's a guy. A, he's not going to hurt you. No, and he played on. Uh, he actually got a ring, I think, with the Bulls once. Yeah, you know, yeah, one I of those guys right. that sat on it. You know, but yeah. but anyway, he had a, a, you know, compared to you know what they would call a total draft bust, a lot of who lasted two or three years in the league. He, I think, he had about twelve or thirteen. Yeah, no, he was not that for sure. And it, you know, you mentioned an interesting time when the before the Kings came here, right before they came here. And it was because, you know, the, the mayor of Sacramento at that time, you know, not, Dan Rudin, right? not real enthusiastic about professional sports teams coming for whatever. And there was all this talk about, you know, Greg Lucanville and, and Ben Venuti and that crew that, you know, went to Kansas City and bought the team and eventually did move it here. A lot of talk that they weren't really interested in the basketball franchise. All they were interested in was land development, that this was a land development scam for Natomas, and they wanted to turn it into another sprawling Silicon Valley, and Ann Rudin didn't want any part of that. So there was no support from the mayor's office, and for a long time, you know, once they started building Arco One out there on Market Street, they denied it was a basketball arena. They said it was an office complex. And you know, Greg Van Dusen, who you know very yes. well, who was with the team, um, he was always their front guy. And, you know, oh, it's, a, it's an office complex, you know, and, and wink, wink. You know, everybody knew what it was, but they said it was an office complex for a very long time because they didn't have the zoning, I guess, that was necessary in order to build the arena to bring the team here. And you can't bring the team here without the arena. So that was a big, it was a big dog and pony yeah, show. Yeah, it was really amazing. Time. One. And, I mean, yeah. with, with Greg, I mean, you know, to me, they ought to build a statue of, of Greg and Joe Benvenuti out somewhere. Yeah, they're you know. kind of the forgotten crew now. Yeah, aren't you know, they? and and obviously their their courage and and doing what they did and going jumping through all the hoops they had to to get a team. I mean, I don't know if Sacramento would still have a major. Yeah, league no, sport. I think you're absolutely right. And remember, not only did they build, they built two arenas. Yeah. With all their own money. Their own money. With private money. Yeah, they built the Arco One on Market Street, and then, you know, the one that everybody knows now is Arco Arena that's still sitting out there. They oh. built two. Yeah, I always remember, too, the, you know, the Sacramento Bee at that time when they f finally had naming rights, uh, Arco, which really, again, Greg was ahead of the game. 
uh, arenas weren't doing that uh, right. too much. That and they wouldn't refuse to call it our core arena. They yeah. call it King's Arena. Yeah, and I, I remember the press conference in front of the original arena on Market, and there were people here, of course, from the Arco company. And Greg said then he said, th and you know, he was a little bit prone to hyperbole, so sometimes you he, think he, sometimes he had to eh, maybe maybe not. But he said this is going to set a standard. He said we're doing something that hasn't been done. And this is going to be the way of future in professional sports. And danged if he wasn't right. I mean, everybody's got their arena name now because it's worth so much money in the naming rights. And, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, too, I mean, it's, it's kind of sad that, quite honestly, in my mind, that, that it, Greg in particular really didn't get a benefit from all the the changes of the North Natomas. Yeah, now yeah, you know, that, you know that, and, and I mean, and they point, really, yeah. probably, you know, the vision probably was there as it should have been. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, the the people that had the vision took all the risks. For, I think you know, in many ways didn't really get a benefit. Yeah, and once they sell, sold the team, I mean, he really did kind of just float into the background. I remember there were a lot of times that I tried to contact him when there were you know relevant stories to building a new arena or whatever, and. Um, you know, he, he talked to me a few times, but he just really was, didn't appear to be interested at all, you know, in mm -hmm. the publicity and, you know, being on camera and, and getting involved in it. But um, talk about an interesting guy. Oh, very interesting. I mean, has nope. there ever been another owner in the history of professional sports that climbed up into the rafters to stop a leak roof? Remember that? Oh, I do. Well, in fact, I had a visit with uh, Gary Gerald, and that kind of came up and, you know, and talked about that, you know, seeing the owner up there stopping the leak and you know and i i said at that time i said yeah you know i i was convinced of two things that number one he was going to fall and and go splat that end in the owner <laughs> that would be the and that, that game deal. yeah <laughs> and then well, i said this the second suspended. thing that really concerned me was you know we were well ahead i was coached at the time we were well ahead of the 76ers at that time and and beating them pretty good because basically Charles Barkley was worn out. They had played the night before, and he mm -hmm. was he was dead. Right. And and I, as as the 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 whole thing took time to get over, I I remember looking down the bench and seeing Charles, and he was fresh. And I said, "Holy hell, we're in trouble now." <laughs> yeah. and, and, why and, did, why and, did this have to happen? Yeah, and we yeah. were because yeah. you know I mean you know you give Barkley a chance yeah. to get a second win or in third and fourth. Well, <laughs> we had nobody. Yeah. And deal with him. Every time there is a floor on the water in arena or or any reason that I have to pull out that old video, I always pull it out. And there's one shot of the coach. Yeah. This guy, what? What's what, going on what's here? What's going on here? <laughs> yeah. yeah it's that was a crazy night. You know, I want to go back a little bit before you uh, came to Sacramento. You're from Wisconsin. Correct. Right? Yeah. I'm sure you're a That's cheesehead. That's Wisconsin, by the way. What's that? Wisconsin. Wisconsin? <laughs> yeah. Well, I did not know that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I appreciate it. Now, so what uh, community are you a native of? Well, I w was born in a little town called Rice Lake, which is in northern Wisconsin, sort of in the middle of the state. And I grew up in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin, which is the home of Line and Kugel's beer. Did by not the way. know. Did yeah. not know that. Yeah, from the Big Eddie Springs, mm -hmm. and nobody really knows to this day that Big Eddie was a horse. So that was kind of a Big Eddie Springs. Yeah, Big Eddie was actually a horse. Did Did he like to it? Uh, drink at the horse? Springs, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Is that pretty much how that happened? Yeah, I'm not exactly sure. But um, well, that's why like people always talk about French lick. Yeah, you know, they always say, "Well, how do you?" You know, I say, "Well, it." It was settled by French, and it was a salt lick. There you go. That, that makes that total sense. Makes total sense. Uh, my first job was in Eau Claire, which is right next to Chippewa Falls. Sure. Very familiar. Um, yeah. Great basketball team. Uh, Ken Anderson. Ken Anderson. Yep. Mike Ratliff, who played yeah, for Mike, the and, Kansas City Kings. And Frank Shady. And Frank Shady. Exactly. Yep. Who yep. also was uh, drafted yep, and played, played by for, the Kings. Yeah. Um, I talked to Shady after he was out of the league. He said he didn't think he had a fair shot with in Kansas City because in practice they'd always put him on Tiny Archibald and say, don't touch him. Don't touch him. So the whole practice was just Archibald going around Shady who stood there going, I can't do it. What am I supposed to do? But he could shoot. He could yeah, really yeah, shoot he, the he ball. He could really shoot. But and Mike Ratliff had, if you, I mean. He had a pretty good career, didn't he? He did. If you look up his stats, I mean, mm -hmm. um, I don't recall him exactly, but I remember one game against Jabari was like 20 and 20. I mean, he could play a little bit. He's 6'10", very athletic, run the floor. Yeah. So I worked in Eau Claire, um, went to Kansas City a lot of times to cover that small school tournament with mm -hmm. the Kings, NAI, NAI. tournament. Yeah, 
Yeah, I had teams and, in there. And, yeah. Oh, did you? Oh, yeah, we won the national championship in 74. Was that from at West Memorial Georgia. Auditorium yeah. or at Kemper? Yeah, yeah that was at, still at, at Memorial. Memorial yeah. yeah. And then later on, I coached at Rockhurst University, which uh, we went to the national tournament at Kemper. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah that times. was a nice building for its time back in yeah, the day. Yeah. Heck of an improvement over Memorial Auditorium. Oh, yeah. That, that's you know, sure. though, Memorial Auditorium, though, I thought really had great atmosphere to it, you know, when it had a good crowd in there. Right. Uh, you know, and of course, now they built a new arena downtown. But I've always said, I mean, it's off the topic a little bit, but had the Kings built, which was Kemper downtown near the stockyards, had they built that arena out by the twin stadiums, you know, where the Royal sure. Stadium and Chiefs... Yeah. The Kings would still be there. Yeah. They, they were bad they, choice for location. Bad choice for location. Yeah. I mean, people didn't live downtown. They, they were used and you know, certainly the parking and right. the access. Yeah. Was there. Yeah. Makes, There's so would many, make all the difference. You know, well, and it's a similar situation here. I mean, God bless, you know, Kevin Johnson when he was the mayor for doing all he could to keep the Kings. But my impression sort of was if they weren't going to build that arena in the rail yards, you know, that's where he wanted that arena was in the rail yards. And if they weren't going to build it there when kind of like, well, eh, whatever, do do what you got to do. But he really wanted it there. I, obviously, he came on board finally. And, and what a great choice to build yeah. where it's built now. But um, he he had his reasons. He wanted that, you know, rail yards project developed. Yeah, I can understand that. I mean, of course, fortunately now with the Major League Soccer, uh, that, you know, can kind of maybe take care of that issue as well. Yeah, tell me a little bit about, uh, especially your, you know, your background in, in college, maybe even going back to your high school days, uh, you know, your interest, uh, what what plans or visions sure. you had for Jim yeah. Crandall at that time. Chai High, they called it, Jippewa Falls High School. Um, two things I was always interested in were public speaking and sports. Turns out I was a way better public speaker than an athlete. Uh -huh. um, I did play in high school, a uh, pretty good first baseman. Played a couple of years of football, a couple of years of basketball, but not a great athlete. Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of gravitated into the public speaking part of it, which actually started out, like, you know, you always hear singers say, well, it started at a church choir. Well, I actually started, it plays in church. Oh, really? My mom would take me to church. I went to church every Sunday forever. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where I kind of, you know, developed a love for it and just sort of transitioned into it. And uh, stuck with it, and uh, it's worked out all right, I guess. No, I think it's worked out great. <laughs> I, I was going to tell you, it reminds me, I, I, just for your information, I know you really want to know this. I do. That I starred in the first musical at Springs Valley High School in French Lake, Indiana. I played as uh, Mr. Crane of Sleepy Hollow. I was Ichabod Crane, and, and, and he had a little singing Role. Really? Yes. Well, I never had a singing role, but I was Abraham Lincoln in the high school production of Abe Lincoln in Illinois. Abe Lincoln in Illinois. That's right. Had me a top hat and everything. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm sure you have no pictures of that. <laughs> no, and, thank God. <laughs> and, yeah. and they're all going to, I've told you a story before, but I was, it kind of brought some strange memories. You mentioned that because I did some commercials for the Chuck Swift uh, oh, yeah. Dodge for years, uh, uh, and and on President's Day they'd always make me dress up like Abe Lincoln <laughs> and George Washington. You know, it's kind of amazing yeah. what a man will do to yeah, exactly to, to get a make a buck, make yeah. a buck. You yeah, know, exactly. But uh, you know, so got out of high school, went to uh, University of Wisconsin. So I'm big Badger, big backer. Badger fan. Yeah. Um, my greatest athletic accomplishment, a friend of mine from high school was a walk-on in the football team our freshman year at Wisconsin. Tom Whiting was his name. Came over to my dorm. We went out in the back to sh shoot hoops. They got a million hoops in the playground behind uh, the dorm. A couple of guys said, hey, you want to go two-on-two? -two? So we went two-on-two -two with these guys and smoked them. And I don't think I missed a shot the entire time. And when we got done, a bunch of guys who had started watching us came over and said, dude, you know who that guy was? Clarence Sherrod. Does sure. that name sound familiar? Yeah, sure. One of the great guards and scorers in Wisconsin history. And we smoked him, Jerry. We, we smoked, smoked him. him. Now, I, <laughs> now, I assume there's no evidence to this. Is no. <laughs> no. Are you telling me you're not going to take my word? <laughs> no, I, I am. I, you know, I'm, I know you wouldn't even brought it up. if, you, if you, <laughs> No, I would have. But I, <laughs> no, that, that is true. Well, um, as you know, I mean, and, and yeah, and basketball being the 
what it is, emotion, and uh, as we've seen thousands of times, a shooter gets on a roll. Yeah, no, I can you know, shoot. That's the one thing I could do is shoot. But mm -hmm. I seriously, I have no athletic ability at all. My my legs are super small. I mean, short. My you know my height is in my torso. And my legs are real heavy, and I just I can't get off the floor, and I can't move. So, but I basketball is my favorite sport. I love it. Tell you what, it's amazing with the the Badgers in basketball and football. What amazing program they have there now. You know, really, it's nationally ranked just about all the time in everything. Yeah, they should have won the national championship. They should have won the NCAA tournament a few years ago. They beat unbeaten Kentucky. Kentucky, remember? Yeah. And they they shot everything they had in that game. You know, I'm a firm believer in the psychology of the sports. And after that game, in their mind, I think they, you know, they said nobody could beat Kentucky. And they beat them, and they just they didn't have anything left to play do. Well, I was, of course, I remember that. And, of course, I probably would see it a little different. I, I, I mean, I think they played the perfect game against Kentucky. But if you look at their overall talent base, you know, pretty – you know, Kaminsky, right. a kind of a marginal NBA yeah. player. Decker they, was pretty good. Decker was pretty good, but he's not able to been able yeah. to. And he was I mean, for crazy a off the hook in that game. Remember against yes. Kentucky? Sure. Yeah. And, uh, but so, yeah, you're probably right. I mean, they weren't, you know, they didn't have the same level of talent, but I, I still think that part of the, you know, reason they lost to Duke is because they just didn't have anything left after giving all they had. Well, I'm sure Kentucky. that's true, too. Yeah, yeah, they had to go the harder route and. But, you know, I, th I thought, you know, I mean, coaching-wise, uh, just that guy, just a great coach. Yeah, yeah. They, and, you know, their football program has done really well, too. I mean, you know, they're a top-10 team almost every year, not quite good enough to make the playoff, but always really, really good. So, yeah, I don't think – and the, and the hockey program, because being from Wisconsin, Wisconsin, Wisconsin. And, and playing, you know, uh, recreational hockey – um, back there, that's a huge sport, and uh, it used to be the WCHA was the league they played in at that point was Michigan, Michigan State, most of the Big Ten mm -hmm. schools, um, and then like Denver from out west had a big hockey program, but they've won the national championship. Bob Johnson, one of the most famous hockey coaches in the country, so Wisconsin has a good athletic history. They really do. Well, like, yeah, I was going to say, and of course, professionally with the uh, Brewers and former Braves uh, yeah. years ago, mm -hmm. and then of course the Packers. They right, all the time. Spent a lot of Sundays at Lambeau Field in Green Bay when I worked back there. Mm -hmm. the, the guy that ran the news department, the news director, was a, a pilot, mm -hmm. and it was a great opportunity for him because he didn't have his own plane. But he would rent a plane, charge it to the station, and we'd fly to Green Bay, which was just a couple hour flight, if that even, and cover the games and fly back with his stuff and put it on the air on Sunday night. So. Um, been a lot of Sundays at Lambeau Field, were really fun. Well, I became a kind of a Packer fan in my high school days uh, for strange reason. Uh, Paul Harning, yeah, all the time Golden great. Boy, Golden Boy, number five. The year he was kicked out of football for gambling, mm -hmm. he, you know, he's from Louisville. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, Louisville, which is like fifty miles uh, east of uh, French Lick. Well. There's a big resort hotel, in, too, actually. But uh, anyway, I was a lifeguard at the, the resort hotel. Really? And Paul. A Paul, singing lifeguard. Well, I did not sing <laughs> after, you know, my my uh, <laughs> foray into, into that. But but anyway, my, as lifeguard, and Paul would, uh, one of the lifeguards, and he would come over periodically uh, during that year and time off when he was around Louisville. And, you know, he'd always bring some friends very lovely, did. very lovely friends, yes, I might add. Yes, I, I know and, he had that reputation. And I always remember, he's so nice, so he'd always make a point to talk to us, and then they had uh, really nice, what they call cabanas that, uh, sure. that could be rented, you know, and mm -hmm. have parties and stuff. I gotcha. And, and so Paul would always have one of those with his uh, friends, and then when he'd leave, he'd, he'd always tell us guys he'd leave a little uh, something to drink. A little extra there. Oh, that, really? That we probably shouldn't have had, but we did. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to apologize. He's though. just trying to be nice. He was trying to be nice. Yeah. And so Paul was a Hall of Famer in many ways in my mind. <laughs> there you go. No, he was a great running back. Oh, great, boy. great player. All around Jimmy player. Taylor was yep. the fullback. Jim Taylor and, and you know, Star, the quarterback. Yeah. And, uh, Boyd Dowler. One of, now, like you're, in your career, at what point kind of high school, college, did you say, you know, I mean, you, you You'd always said you know, how much you, public speaking was easy for you, and, and you could see where that'd be a route. But did it lead to television, radio? Right. When I was a senior in high school, I, I, I was on the debate team, 
and my debate coach uh, worked part time at a radio station, got me a job working part time. It was an AM FM in the same building as a TV station and owned by the TV station. Got me working uh, part time for the FM station at night, which basically was just making sure the station stayed on the air. I mean, like every half hour, you know, uh-huh. this is WEAU FM. It's 1230 on Thursday morning. <laughs> 42 degrees in Eau Claire, and then you play another record. You know, that uh-huh. was about it. It wasn't like a real DJ job, but that was my first job. And Did you get a select the records, or was that kind of a... No, it was, it was uh, basically not classical stuff, but like easy listening kind of stuff. I mean, that was the format of the FM station mm-hmm. at that time. I mean, FM radio was fairly new at that time. Um, you know, remember, this is, uh, you know, the early 70s, mm-hmm. so... There were no hip-hop stations on FM at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I started doing a little work on the AM station, which played country music, which I developed. And I hated country music when I started, and by the time I was done, I loved it. And I still do. I really like it. Oh, yeah. Well, especially some of the the latest kind of things, you know, yeah. Chris Stapleton and I know. Ten- I actually whiskey have and tickets so. for the Blake Shelton show coming up at the Golden One Center. Yeah. Really looking forward to that. And then the sports guy, the main sports guy for the TV station was also a teacher in Eau Claire, and he decided he couldn't do both jobs. So I auditioned to do the weather, hoping I could eventually move into his spot. Mm-hmm. Because the guy that did the weather was also a small market, little TV station. So the guy that did the weather was also the sales manager. And he only did the weather because he thought it was good for him. He could sell better to people when they recognized him. Mm-hmm. You know, he'd come go- in to sell in commercials and they'd say, hey, you're yeah, the guy on the weather. The weather man. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So he wanted to cut back to just two days. So I started doing weather three days a week. And I, I, I didn't know anything about weather. Absolutely nothing. But... I got a great memory, Jerry. So I would just take the weather forecast from the Associated Press off Mm -hmm. the wire, Mm -hmm. memorize it, and go do that. The one time I got in trouble is, and remember, this is back in the day, so there's no digital stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. exactly. I mean, we had this map of Wisconsin, and it had glass over it, and we would write the temperatures for Green Bay, Madison, Milwaukee, Eau Claire, whatever. We'd write the temperatures in a magic marker, and uh, the news director, the boss of the news department, wanted us to do it live because he thought it would put, you know, some action in it. Uh-huh. So you'd go on and you'd say, okay, tonight's temperature's here, 52 in Green Bay, you know, and like that. Well, you'd go out before the show and write them lightly in pencil so you knew what they were. More than once I forgot to write them lightly in mm-hmm. pencil. And I would turn to the map and say, oh, no, because I had no idea what the temperatures were. So you just had to guess? Yeah. So I figured, well, it was fairly warm today. So <laughs> 72 so. in Milwaukee, and it's Green Bay's north of there, so it's a little cooler. 65 in Green Bay. So anytime you watch the weather, except for Christina, mm-hmm. just remember, <laughs> they could be making it up. Could be <laughs> making Exactly. <laughs> That's great. I was going to well, I was gonna say, it is amazing how the weather you know, reports have changed so much. I mean, mm-hmm. they, they just got it down to the yeah. hour, you know, yeah. when the rain's coming through. And I mean, seriously, and with Christina, if you watch her weather forecast and then the next day remember what she said, I mean, she is like on the money yeah, right 99%, on the, 99% of the time. 99% of the time. Yep. Absolutely. If she says it's going to rain at three, it's going to rain a quarter at three. of an inch, it's going to rain at three, a quarter of an inch. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. I always, my wife periodically, she'll kind of second guess. She'll say, well, it's supposed to, they said it's going to rain at three. I said, they said it's going to rain at three in Sacramento. So we're in Roseville. It's going to take a, you know. Yeah. Just, and just, that, that is, that truly is one thing that people don't understand is if she says 20% chance of showers, it, you know, maybe it that probably does rain here, but maybe not here. And people, well, it didn't rain on my head. So that mm-hmm. must've been wrong. <clears throat> so, uh, Jim. Please tell me how you got from <laughs> there and that the experience uh, to Sacramento. There was a uh, broadcasting publula- uh, pu- publication called Broadcasting Magazine, and in the back it used to have job listings. And, you know, Eau Claire is a very small market. I think at that time it was like number 116 in the country mm-hmm. out of like 205. And, you know, in the TV business you're always looking to move up. You want to go to a bigger market. Sure. You know, more exposure, more money more goodness. Mm -hmm. Um, 
So everybody looks in Broadcasting Magazine, and there was a posting for the job at KTXL. And I called, talked to the news director, Don Ross, flew me out, we talked, and I was sure when I left that I got the job. I went home, told my wife, Patty, I said, okay, we're moving to California. He called me a couple of weeks later and said, no, we decided to go with a local guy who was Dave Grosby, sure. who was a radio guy at that time on KFBK. Yeah. They decided to go with him since he had, you know, local knowledge, local mm -hmm. contacts. About a year and a half later, Don called me back, and I don't remember the circumstances exactly, but he said, Dave is, Dave, uh, is leaving, and if you want the job, we'd love to have you. So that's how it happened. And, I'll uh, be done. Yeah, we came out, and uh, we really like it here. You know, really like it here. Well, I was going to say, I think that's one thing about, of course, Wisconsin or Indiana. Just get out here and, uh, you know, the climate. Uh, yeah. The, the worst days. I always said, you know, just being Indiana and living a long time in Kansas City area. You know, I always said in Kansas City, you'd have 60 good days a year. And, and the other 300, there's something. Yeah. Stormy, <laughs> tornadoes, but not good. too hard rain, snow, ice, something. We were out here a couple of, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple of weeks, and I think it was late October, early November maybe. One of the guys had a party Saturday night at his house, and we went there and got to know people and whatever. Time to leave, and he's, he's telling people to go start their cars because it's cold. Yeah. It was like 45, you know. I'm thinking, yeah. geez, if it was 45 in Wisconsin in November, we'd be outside having a picnic yeah, in shorts. Yeah, in T-shirts, yeah. Yeah, exactly. No, it's really amazing. Yeah. You know, I, I always remember just the first year we moved here from the Midwest, uh, you know, basically <coughs> is that Excuse me. even in the hot part of the summer, you know, it'd be 95 to 100 degrees in the afternoon. I'd go <coughs> jogging a lot. Didn't bother me. No, I love jogging. You know, because it wasn't, uh, you yeah. know, any humidity. Yeah. Now, I mean, now I'm totally spoiled. No, no, no. I, you know, I don't even venture outside after <laughs> 10 o'clock, you know, during the summer. And right. Till, till well, it, it gets it, plenty it, hot here, that's for sure. But, right? but, I mean, it's so different, you know. Yeah. But, but I do think, you know, you just kind of get spoiled by being here as yeah. well, too. It's, and when you live back there, I mean, you, you know, it, you, you just get used to it. People always say, well, how did you do that? And when you're back there, you don't really think about it. I mean, if that's especially if that's where you grew up, that's, yeah, it, you know, that's, that's the way it is. You know how to deal with it, how to drive in it, how you know how to take care of yourself in it. But yeah, my dad always used to first year. I think we moved out here. Uh, he'd call and say, "Well, about time for you to put the storm windows on, isn't it?" <coughs> I said, "Dad, excuse me, we don't need them." Yeah. He said, "Well, how about snow tires?" I said, "Dad, really, you don't need them unless they're going up in the mountains." Yeah, exactly. You know, but that was just uh, kind of routines. You know that that uh, he. You got used to. Yeah, and t talking about the storm windows, what, you know, people always say, "What's you know, how different is it out there?" And I say, "Well, for one thing, if you left on vacation for a week and forgot to lock your doors or close your windows, the worst thing that's going to happen is one of your neighbors is going to think, you know, it might rain. I'm going to go close his windows. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's just a, a in a lot of ways, it's just a really different environment. Oh, it really is. I I've always said that one of the big differences I noticed just is my daily walks, even yet today, is that almost nobody will speak. You know, everybody's concerned. I've written about that on Facebook. What, know, you, yeah, what is wrong with people? Yeah. I always make an I, effort I to... I always say hi. Yeah. Or, you know, or, I mean... You head know, down right past you. And, and, and you, you know, I always notice, too, like traveling around the, the country for years, you know, with the team and all, and, and it's always different in, in certain parts, you know, hmm. of the country. Uh, but certainly I thought, always thought probably California might be the worst in that regard. You know, it's like everybody, I think, just assumes you're a, a predator of yeah, some sort. Yeah, I know, and, right. Everybody and, uh, is so, in. well, it's, it's the same way, you know, there's no fences in Wisconsin between homes. Right. You know, all the yards connect. Yeah, exactly. And everybody knows each other. Yeah. And honest to God, I couldn't tell you the names of some of the people that live within, you know, Oh. A wedge of, of where I live. I've gotten, you know, I have to say, I've kind of gotten used to the, I kind of like the overall backyard privacy where, you know, there's no human being can <laughs> right. see, yeah. <laughs> see in. So uh, yeah. anyway. No, but, but I, it, think it, I mean, it is just, it, it, that is different. I mean, you know, like I say, back the, no fences back there. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody talks here. You get up in the morning, open the garage door, drive your car out, and you're going to work, come back, open the garage door, put your car in, you're in the house. That's yeah. it. That's it. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I always remember just as a kid growing up in a small town, I'm sure it's the same way with you, is that you'd drive around every time, you'd honk every time you see some, yep, somebody. Yeah, exactly. You, yeah. you know, and yeah. I mean, if you did it now, somebody might 
be road rage and they might, <laughs> yeah. might attack That'd you. That'd be way to so start trouble. Know. That's what that but, is. Now, when you uh, when you came uh, to Sacramento and, and uh, your first job was sports? Is yeah, that... yeah. I started doing sports. And I did sports for, uh, I think, probably about three years, maybe a little bit more. And then the guy who was the main news anchor at night, Ted Mullins was his name, mm -hmm. really a nice man. Um, Ted actually had a small heart attack on the air one night. And we didn't know it at the time, but, you know, going back and looking at the tape, I mean, he was sweating. He was making a lot of mistakes that he didn't make. Mm -hmm. You know, he'd ask the producer a question. And 30 seconds later, he'd ask him again the same question. Um, but he left to go to Stockton because his daughter was an Olympic caliber figure skater, young high school girl. Mm -hmm eyes on the Olympics. And she practiced in Stockton. They had the best rink and the best coaches. So a couple of nights a week, he would drive down there to be with them, his wife and his daughter, so that he could go to practice the next morning. And he had another heart attack on the way to Stockton. And eventually Ooh. he died that night in the hospital. Uh, very sad. Again, really a nice man. And um, the station came to me and said, okay, we, we'd like you to do news now. And I said, I uh, no, I don't, I don't want to do news now. And they said, well, read your contract because you're going to do news now. So I did news for like about three years. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I, you know, was able to move back into sports once they realized that wasn't my forte. So Yeah, I, my first recollection, I think, was kind of you doing news, in fact. I yeah. think it was early in the King's rain here. Yeah, uh, I did it for about two and a half years, and people still to this day who remember that I did news, they'll say, uh, well, what did you like better? You like doing news or sports? And my pat answer is, well, would you rather go to a city council meeting or the Kings game? That That's kind of my, yeah. my answer. Yeah, that's I, did, I didn't like doing news at all. I mean, there's no opportunity to really express yourself or show your personality or give your opinion about anything. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's for the most part, it's serious stuff. So, you just kind of get through it and, you know, yeah, go I, on I to the next Yeah, I reading some of, you know, your background, too. Where you, you made the statement I thought was really, really interesting how, how much fun sports are for you, whether it's a high school football game or right. certainly a Kings I love game it. or I do. I love minor it. league. Yeah, you yeah. know, just I, I think we can kind of identify there. You know, I'm one of those people still that, you know, ball goes up. It, yeah. It's fun. Yeah, and, you know, basketball is my favorite sport, without without question. And the NBA is my favorite game. And you, you know what, Jerry, there isn't one game I've ever watched. It could be the worst two teams in the league playing the worst game in the history of the sport against each other. But at some point during that game, somebody's going to do something that's going to make me go, whoa, mm -hmm. I can't believe he did that. They're, they are the best, most amazing athletes in all of professional sports. I, I couldn't think. agree more. I, I, I've said the same thing many times. People always say, well, you know, for all the years you did TV and all the bad teams and games and all. I said, well, certainly that's true. But I said, there's never been a game, you know, for me, I love good basketball. And I said, now I'd prefer it be the Kings that's right. playing the good basketball, yeah. but I can appreciate it if the other team is doing it. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, or a great player, yeah. you know, I mean, it'd be hard not to appreciate a, a Michael Jordan or a yeah, Kobe exactly. Bryant or, yeah. you know, LeBron James. Yeah. I mean, greatness is greatness. Yeah. And, and, you know, and getting the opportunity to see it. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm telling you, every game, there's there's something that amazes me that somebody does. And it might be in garbage time, the last guy off the end of the bench who finally got in, but he's going to make some spinning 360 crazy over his head, you know, reverse lay in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all those guys, I don't care if it is the last guy at the end of the bench, all those guys are such amazingly skilled athletes. Yeah. To get to this, to, to the level, yeah. I mean, you're I one mean, of you don't the get three or 400 by, best by in the world. Is, yeah. Or said it's kind of, I love to watch golf. I don't play it, but I love to watch it. But I've, I'm just amazed at the skill level right. of those guys. And I mean, and, yeah. and you might be the, of course, in that sport, you might be the three or four hundredth best in the world, and you don't make tens of millions of dollars. Right. You're, you're, I mean, you're probably making a living, but uh, right. in, in in the NBA now, and of course, uh, of course, when I came to the league, much like when you started following it, uh, the guys didn't, you know, didn't make tons. Yeah. Of, you know, they made a very good living for yeah. sure. Yeah. But, I remember uh, when LaSalle Thompson, you know, held out, signed his new contract. That was a multi-year deal for. 
I think it was less than $10 million. And I, I remember him coming back into the arena and getting a standing ovation. From yeah, the actually, I, it was $800,000 a year. Is that what it was? Yeah, yeah. $800,000 a year. Because at that time, I remember that pretty clear. I think the salary cap was $12 million. Wow. For the team. That's lunch money. Yeah. yeah That's no. lunch I money mean, now. Of course, it's, it's also true is that, the, you know, as you know, the team was, I think, built, bought for $10 million plus $3 million, assuming debts. Yeah. Okay, so about $13 million. That's crazy, right? And now, you yeah. know, worth uh, estimated a billion. Yep. Yeah, so interesting. Back, you know, we go back so far, but I always remember, you know, the player salaries, or certainly coaches' salaries. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I bet I, you do. Bet oh, you remember that. Oh yes. Oh, I do. Yeah. I do. I now, do. if you're not making five million a yeah. year as a coach, you're underpaid. well. I always said I was kind of one of my goals way back then. I was hoping to, you know, get a one of those multi-million dollar deals, and then you know, they, I, I'd always tell them, if you need to fire me, I'll be very magnanimous about <laughs> yeah, it. I, I'm good with it. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll be be okay. I still get the check. But, and you know what? That's I. If I had all the money in the world, I could not own a pro sports team. Mm -hmm. For that reason, and also the salaries that the guys make, and if they get hurt or they don't produce, I mean, you, I would tear my hair out, you know? I mean, when the Kings were into Chris Webber for all that money after he jacked up his knee and it was yeah. never the same, still had to pay him all that money. I mean, yeah. can you imagine being the owner and writing checks for $20 million well, to you this know, guy that's every the thing year? There with Chris, too, you know, when, and that's part of the reason he was traded, you know. Right. And he had most of the money on the contract, and I think Philadelphia thought they were getting Chris Webber. Well, they were getting yeah. a one-legged well, version of Chris Webber. You should have watched and, some tape. And, you know, they, you know, I... I I know he bounced around at it, but I think Philadelphia actually paid him, had to pay him forty, fifty million to go away. Yeah, you know, and I, wouldn't that drive you crazy though? Well, it if would. You, I mean, you're an and, owner, and I think that's part of the reason why you know the seven-year contracts at that time. You know, they mm -hmm. the, next, the collective bargaining agreement got rid of that. Yeah. So I think five's the, the most the length you can have right. now. And, and you know, and I don't begrudge the players that money. No, I mean, I good for them if yeah. they can get it, get it. Well, you know? and I always said it, that's the thing. It's the the salary cap's based on basically 50% of revenue. Right. So it's either they get they're yeah. getting half. Yeah, I mean, the owners, owners wouldn't be paying them that money if they if couldn't afford there. it and didn't think they were worth it. Of course, my, my stance has always been the, the if there's anybody that didn't get in a fair deal, it's not the players are, the owners are, it's it's the fans. Uh, you know, the revenues, it's based on revenues. Well, so much of revenues yep. come from national TV deals and TV deals. Uh, maybe give fans a break on tickets but yeah you know, anyway. yeah from and what i understand there's such a small percentage of the owner's income comes from ticket sales oh, anyway it, it you know. really is uh yeah, yeah as it's opposed to school. when the teams when i first came to the league and in those days i mean that was the the biggest part of it yeah you know, yeah i remember talking to greg van dusen about that actually and then you know how imp how important it was at that time but it's just not that big a factor not anymore that big a factor TV anymore contracts. and of course yeah. that's why it's you know escalated but then it also is true why, with the TV ratings going down, it's it's got everybody's attention right. at at the highest levels when the next yeah. negotiating thing comes up. But yeah, uh, it'll be interesting if that TV revenue does decline when they sign, you know, another national contract with ABC or ESPN or yeah, whomever, whomever it might be next time. What will happen to the salary cap and what the players' reaction will be to because that? Because it's always based, everybody assumes it's always going to go up. It's yeah, always say what it's if it starts like going a, down? Kind of like uh, owning a house, you know. Well, if you start to, assuming it's always going to right. go up, you, you can get yeah. this. At Martin's some point, good. it's going to peak, you'd yeah, think. As yeah. old people have lived through those times yeah. where it didn't always go up. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. And uh, I was going to ask you, too, you know, of your years covering the NBA and the Kings in particular, if there are there players that really come to mind that you just really in particular enjoyed watching? Well, I loved watching Weber. I mean, he was he was a heck a marvelous of a player. Talent, yeah, yeah. Am amazing talent. Um, but my favorite player to watch, without question, would be Jay Will. Yeah, White Chocolate, yep. Jason Williams. Mine too, honestly. Really, honestly, yeah. I, I I've said this many times. I probably the last time I really enjoyed watching practice, and, and you know, because I've been around enough practices. In my sure, life, uh, was with when Jason Williams. Yeah, because every day he did something in practice that was just Take your breath. Well, you that know. that elbow pass that he actually did in a, a couple times. Yeah. yeah. I, what 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 just happened out there? Well, you but, know, he would practice that kind of stuff after you know, and I always say, watching him, you know, spend a half hour throwing balls off a wall after practice, different ways. 
You know, I said, who does that? Right. But, yeah. but then I've, I've told this story, too. And, I, it, you know, I, I spent, I did a little volunteer work when I was a college coach in Georgia, at West Georgia. Cotton Fitzsimmons was coach of the Hawks. Oh, and really? we were friends uh, going back to junior college days. And, uh, you know, in those days you had one assistant. So sometimes in summer leagues and or uh, uh, veteran camps or, or veteran uh, camp, you'd have a lot more players. So I'd, he'd have me come over and help out a little bit and uh, you know, sometimes give me a little little something yeah, which was well, nice. Pretty but, good but learning the experience is, too. Uh they had Pete Maravich. Oh wow. And yeah. and it was the same kind of thing. Yeah. You know, it's one of those deals that every day Pete would do something you think and not all of it good. Yeah. But but yeah. it's something you think how, that's not yeah. possible. Well, that's part of why I like Jason Williams. I mean, you you know, he'd lead the break down the floor, and you never know if he's going to go between his legs and behind his back and throw a pass on the money to Weber for a oh. dunk, yeah. or if he was going to come down the court and go behind his, you know, between his legs and behind his back and throw it about three rows up in the stands. Oh, yeah, it could be you know, all It was the unpredictability above. of it. Yeah. But I know every every uh, before every game, uh, well, Jim Cosmore and I are doing the, the pre- and post-game kind of show, or pre, pre-game show, they'll have highlights, and almost always they'll have a couple of minutes of Jay Will. Yeah. And I've seen it a thousand times, yep. and I enjoy it every bit as much each no, time. I, no, I totally agree. And I've people, said it, you know. People he, post it on Twitter every once in a while. Yeah. You know, here's two minutes of Jay Will. And, I mean, that crossover against Gary Payton, oh, one of the great defenders, great defenders in the history of the in league. The history of the league. Made had him look no like, chance. Made him look like a fool. Yeah, he tried <laughs> to trip Jay Will and couldn't even do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, but I mean, that's that he was, I, and I've said this. I mean, and, and you know, and Maravich was one of a kind. But there's nobody to me, Jason Williams. There's not a. He's by far the best handler of a basketball and most creative handler in the history of the game. Well, that by I've far. ever seen. Yeah, he does. You know, he does things at 90 mile an hour that that some of these other guys yeah. that that are pretty fancy with it. I was listening to one of the talking heads on ESPN talking about John Morant, the nice. Very nice rookie from Memphis. Yeah, no, he looks And he's good. very creative. Yeah. He can do a lot of... I said, yeah, yeah, he does it about 20 mile an hour. Jason Williams did that at 90. Yeah. And and a lot better. Now, I'm not saying that probably Morant's going to be a better player. Right. Not arguing, but yeah. no, but I said, don't 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 ever compare yeah, don't, somebody don't, to... Don't talk about somebody's handle and compare him to yeah, Jay Will because yeah, yeah, it's not there. Come on. You know, not. I liked Reggie Theus, too, Jerry. Yeah, I really yeah. did. I, I did, too, yeah. I thought he, you know... I, re- I remember I did a commentary one time because I, I don't know if you remember this, but fans used to like to blame Reggie for, for all, everything. all the pre- yeah for yeah, everything for everything. And you know I said, listen, if everybody on that team did their job as well as he does his, we'd be in the playoffs. Yeah, you know I I just thought that uh, he was a really good solid player who really he seemed to care. I mean I don't know if he really oh. did, but he certainly seemed to really care. Oh, he was really competitive. I always said that's what. People didn't realize. I mean, he'd play every game, and you know, I think a lot of fans or people that didn't like Reggie or didn't want to like him say, "Well, he's kind of a pretty boy and all that." Hey, everybody, he was, you know, Reggie was tough. He, you know, he'd play hurt, and guys didn't, and guys knew it. I mean, he 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 was really a a, a, a heck of a player. Right. I, I've always said that that first year I was with the Kings as a second assistant, uh, we we went to the playoffs. Uh, you know, got beat. But against the, Houston, right? Yeah, yeah. But but you know they made a trade that off year traded Mike Woodson and and uh, Larry Drew and uh, to the Clippers for Derek Smith. And I always said if if the, honestly, that was Joe Axelson's move. Yeah, yeah. If they hadn't have done that, uh, honestly, that team would have been a playoff team for four or five years. You had great chemistry. You know the guys really liked one another. Reggie was Reggie, and I mean I always say. You know, Reggie had his own little agenda sometimes. Right. But uh, but still, you know, Eddie and Mike Woodson, Eddie Johnson, Mike Woodson, those guys, they they they, they, they liked him. Right. You know, they said, eh, that's just Reggie being Reggie, you know, type thing. Right. When Reggie would, that Derek you know, Smith trade, I, I mean, he was damaged goods when the, yeah. when the, when he, the Axelson he, traded for him. He had, uh, and he was a highest paid player. Uh, you know, no question had he... And not had the knee had had knee surgery and coming off mononucleosis, and I mean, uh, what did go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know about the mono thing. Yeah, had that too, yeah, huh? it just it was, uh, yeah, yeah, it just was uh, really a I terrible. If I mistake. remember right, he had lit up the Kings a couple of times. Yeah, and well, Joe the opener, kinda... the opener, in the new when the Kings first came, the very first game the Kings played was against the Clippers, and Derek Smith had thirty six and beat the Kings. 
I mean, I remember it well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, came from behind. And, and I always said that that was, you know, in their mind. Uh, yeah, Joe just got infatuated with him just, for some reason. For some reason. Yeah. And I mean, and, and having said that, it had, you know, he was that terrifically good before yeah. those no, things he, we yeah, mentioned, no, you know, was, and I mean, but, it's like, but injuries change. It's like Chris Webber. Yeah, well, Chris exactly. was never the same after that yeah. damaged knee. Right. And uh, you know who this team needs is Mark Oberding. He was a tough buckaroo, wasn't he? <laughs> wasn't he? Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I always, I always remember with Mark. He'd always in close games and stuff. And this was when I was coaching. He'd always say, "We, you, do you coach? You need to get. Do we need to get Eddie Johnson open?" I said, "Yeah." He said, oh. "He said you run blank, blank, whatever play it was." He said, "You run at my side." I'll get him open. I bet he would too. And, and I guarantee you, oh yeah. yeah. I mean, he, he, and as, you know, as illegal screens, but they didn't call them then. Right. That's you part know, they, of the game. You just to be man enough to, to do what you do. Right. And, uh, so yeah, that was, uh, yeah, the different game then. You yeah, know, that was, I, and that was a fun, I mean, that was a fun team with Drew and Reggie and Oberding. Like and, I say, uh, that was a, Thompson and Otis Thorpe. Otis Thorpe. Was really emerging. Yeah. yeah. And no, I was going to say, Eddie Johnson, a great no, shooter. No doubt in my mind that that would have been a, 44 to 46 seven win team right for for several years yeah. because you know they had they weren't that old and but they were veterans right and uh so you know things uh happened so that was uh the first kind of yeah and drew and woodson both went on to be head coaches in the yeah. league and yeah I, i've always uh yeah i thought that two people say which did you really suspect they'd be coaches uh i was i wasn't surprised that uh mike woodson was uh you know a little more Certainly surprised a little bit with Reggie, right. you know, not that he I always knew he really knew the game. I just right. didn't. I just assumed he'd probably didn't go think into he wanted to rather, TV, rather go to Hollywood TV and, uh, or yeah, yeah, things of that nature. Uh, Larry, a little less, less so. Sometimes, yeah, the some of the guys have come through. I mean, Danny Ainge and Jim Less, uh, totally not surprised. I, right. I knew I knew Danny would be terrific at whatever he did, and, and, and seems Jim, to be, huh? Yeah, great. great one of the best GMs in the league and not, not surprising at all to me. And then of course, Jim Les, I knew he'd be a good, really good coach, which right. he is. Yeah. You know, I mean, sometimes, you know, it sometimes you don't. Sure. Yeah. But, uh, I, I was going to say to the, uh, you know, your years, you know, covering all sports, uh, you know, I mean, really Sacramento is just such a great area for baseball. You know, the tremendous uh, number, amount of talent. When I, when I first came here, Jerry, literally the biggest sports event in Sacramento was the Pig Bowl. You know, the, yeah. the, the football game every year between the fire department and the yeah. police department. I mean, it was huge. It you, drew sold 20, out, 20 or 30, yeah, sold people. out Hughes Stadium. Yeah. Huge bonfire the night before the game. I mean, it was like one of the biggest things in town, the Pig Bowl. And now we got a pro basketball team and soon to get the MLS team. MLS. And, yeah, things are. Of course, uh, I've, I still believe that if the A's would have moved, would move up here, I th you know, I know they talk about TV market and all that, but still, uh, yeah, this, this city would support it. Yeah, I know that the fans would support it, but there's the whole, you know, corporate partnerships. Oh, yeah, that's, and that's I, an I, issue I, that, you know. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. And. With all the problems we have getting stadiums built, um, you know, somebody's going to have to fork up a bunch of money to build a stadium because Rayleigh Field, as I understand it, is not, uh, you can't You can't enlarge it, it enough. Exactly. Huh? Yeah, uh -huh. it, wasn't, it wasn't built to have the seating capacity increase. So It's yeah. a beautiful little no, it's field, nice. though, isn't it, though? Yeah, yeah, yeah it really yeah. is. a great atmosphere and, there. And I'm sure that this is probably off topic, but talking to, this is one of my pet peeves, this River Cats thing. I, I think the River Cats are great for Sacramento. I think their stadium is great. I think it's tremendous entertainment. It's great for families to go out there. But my thing about minor league baseball, especially at the AAA level, is winning is not the thing. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's not the most important thing. And, you know, I always tell they say, well, what do you mean by that? They try to win. Well, they do when they're on the field, obviously. They do try to win. But if they were playing the seventh game of the deciding championship series, and they only play three game series, if they play the third game and yeah. it's tied one to one, and they're ahead by a run going to the ninth inning, and the phone, and they have the, the best closer in the history of the franchise ready to go to pitch the ninth to wrap up the championship. If the Giants called and said, hey, uh, we're not sure our guy's going to be able to go tomorrow, so don't throw your closer tonight. We might, we might have to call him up. He wouldn't pitch he the game. He wouldn't pitch. 
because winning is not the most important thing. Yeah, it's the, all player development. Yeah, yeah, the big club is the most important thing, and that just bugs the heck mm-hmm. out of me. It, it just really, and plus, if you, I always threaten to send Mark Dembski out there who works with me at Fox. Yeah. I said, I want you to go outside the main gate when they get to the seventh inning and talk to people coming out and ask them the score. Mm-hmm. They wouldn't know the score. They would know, huh? No, but yeah. I mean, it's fun. It's great entertainment, but it's not really about the game. And I just, I have a hard time processing that. I guess. No, I can say, I, I, I can say that. I mean, I think it really so often it becomes a, a on my mind, it's a little bit of a picnic with a exactly with some activity yeah, in front well, of yeah, you. with a nice background. <laughs> with yeah, nice, you yeah. know, once you once but, you kind of yeah. get, get but there. don't misunderstand if the. River Cats people are listening. I, I think it's great that we have this AAA team here for a thousand different reasons, but it's just that whole winning thing. Well, you in know, professional and, sports, it yeah. bothers me. And and as you know, every AAA team is the same. Exactly. Sure. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, mean, it's not just, like they're unique. In that yeah. Respect. No, it's just yeah. the way it is. I think it's basically the same way in G League. And, you know, mm, sure, sure. I mean, it's it's not saying they're the players that are on the floor. They're trying to win. Yeah. But uh they that's not where they want to be right and it's about developing and yeah and and, uh, and in too many cases it's first guy to half court shoot so <laughs> yeah a little bit of that, <laughs> that helps, you know a little yeah. bit of that i think so well i i don't know i i tell you it's really been enjoyable i uh of course followed you for years and years and of course we're i'm really old i mean you're yeah you we're right, I'm, I'm right there with you I mean, pretty you close know, we I, mean, I always say we've been to the county fair and rode every ride just about <laughs> That's right. a couple times a couple yeah. times but hey i i i love it i really do i really yeah. i every day i look uh look forward to going in and, and putting it together and deciding what's important and what's not and what i think people are interested in and what they're not interested in and you know, sometimes my little, you know, five minutes on the air at 10 o'clock, that's a, it can be the best five minutes of my day if everything goes right. But, um, and I, I, you know, I want to thank you not only for having me on your show, which has been awesome, but you, you've always been, you know, some guys just they shy away from the media. They don't want anything to do with us. But, um, you know, I really appreciate the fact that, you know, in all the different roles you had with the Kings and as a coach and a player personnel guy and a general manager and the Monarchs and all that stuff. I mean, you've always been um, media friendly and, all, and always honest. And if you didn't want to talk about something, you just let us know up front that, you know, I'm not going to go there or whatever. And that's unique for executives and coaches in pro sports. And I know that everybody who's worked in the media in town and covered you and your teams has, has always appreciated that. So well, thank well, you thank for you. that. You're very nice there. I, I mean, I always did think that, you know, uh, you guys got a tough job, you know, I mean, it's a tough job. I would just like, you know, whether as a coach or front office person, I mean, those are all tough jobs and, and why make it tougher on people? Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. I mean, sometimes, like you say, sometimes you you're in a spot where you can't deal with something, but right. uh, and might as well be honest about that too. But uh, anyway, you know, you've been, you know, you've been one of the good guys over the years for all the years, and and really, I, I think with, uh, you know, the sports coverage in in this city, it's it's been terrific. You know, very fair. I mean, I always said, uh, you know, I've been you know the kings have been criticized justifiably uh for the most part uh, players have been criticized uh, and praised right justifiably yeah, and yeah. criticized I, I mean that's the whole thing it's not like a a new york or something where it's just uh that's guys have got to find something to attack exactly that, yeah that's kind of the name of the game in some places but, yeah um i just hope the kings get it turned around again because that you know um you know, we were talking before the show. My thing is that, you know, the Kings will be on a losing streak and somebody will say, well, what do you think of that? My line is I get paid the same whether they win or lose. Sure. But the truth is that I would rather have them win. And I know I'm, you know, supposed to be unbiased reporters and all that nonsense. But it's more fun for everybody when they win. And quite honestly, it makes my job easier because I don't want to I don't want to go in the locker room after they get beat by 30 and they've lost six games in a row and, and, and try to talk to Buddy Heald about why he shot two for nine from the three point line. But send me in there after they're on a winning streak and they've just won by 30 and Heald's made, you know, six of 11. 
then, mm. you know, then he wants to talk because in the other scenario, he doesn't want to talk and I don't, I don't, I don't want to talk, no. but it's fun. It's fun for everybody when they win and it's great for the city and for the fans when they win. So hopefully they get this mess sorted I, out. I hope so. You know, I've always said kind of my goal, if I've got one left, I mean, it's not really to, 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 to work. I'll be a Kings fan regardless, you know, and a basketball fan regardless. Sure. So, but, but when the Kings were really good, I really enjoyed it, truly enjoyed it. But if it happens again, and I'm counting on it happening again while I'm still alive, uh, I will enjoy it far more. Yeah. You know, I mean, after, one of those things I didn't. All, after, after all these years. Yeah, I didn't. Then, yeah. I don't think I appreciated it as much as right. I should have. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll be a little better next time yeah. around. And hopefully, you know, my, my brain, I'm not, you know, slobbering down my chin on the. <laughs> On the, on the front porch, any, any more uh, than know, you not, do now. Not no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do just a couple days a week now. <laughs> yeah, you. You know, somebody mentioned to me the other day. You know, it's been so long since the Kings were good that there are kids now in high school who are Kings fans that never have seen a playoff game, or a good winning, a, team. a really good winning team. That's sad. That's very sad. And and you know, yeah, you start. They start to. You know, and I think, you know, the, the franchise is kind of sold, still trying to sell the 2000, 2001. Well, that, that ship has sailed. Yeah, that's you a know, long time that's ago. A long, that's, that's a long time ago. And yeah. like you say, because uh, young people, they know what's happened two or three years in advance. Sure, that, exactly. That's about the most. I, you know, for me, for me, every once in a while, I have video of just about everything of consequence that's happened since I've been here. I saved it all. And so if something, you know, happens to a player or whatever, a former player, I can go back and find video. And sometimes I'll go back into those old, and they are videotapes. Um, now everything's digital on little discs. But I'll go back into those videotapes, and I'll run into highlights that we've saved of Kings games mm -hmm. from back in the Weber page of days. And I, I just sit there and watch it. I watch the whole thing. I mean, it's no, it's so, beautiful, that was so beautiful, fun. Beautiful basketball. So we've got to get that back. And... Uh, you know, of course, my pet peeve on, on that is that Rick Adelman ought to have a jersey retired in yeah. his honor, and he really ought to be in Naismith Hall of Fame. I mean, I, I, you know, he he was here eight years, eight playoffs, yeah, with different kinds of teams. Yeah, uh, he's had he had more success than any player in the Sacramento Kings franchise. Yeah, good point. I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. No, he's a heck of a coach. Heck of a coach. Yeah. I mean, he wasn't Mr. Cheerful. I always used to get him on that, but that has nothing to do with it. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. uh, he he yeah. really he really probably was the most valuable. Right. You know, I mean, you can't win without talent. The Kings had talent. Sure. But, but he was the perfect guy for it. Yeah. Talking about what we were just talking about, he was he was a little difficult to approach with a microphone sometimes. Oh, I know. Oh, I know. And I, I used to talk to him about that. You know, we'd have a little. And I mean, we've been friends forever and I uh, think the world of him. But I said, you know what? You Sometimes you go out of your way to to be yeah, difficult. Surly. Yeah. yeah, it's just early. I mean, you know, most of these people aren't, they don't have anything against you. You know, if you got problems with the Maloofs, that's one thing, but that's not. Right. The, yeah. I mean, and it's part, you know, it's part of the deal when, you know, and, when you cash your check, that you know, that's, yeah. that's part of it. And I, and I, like I, the way I felt then too, it's like, well, you, you know, they're paying you very well. They should. Well, you don't have to agree with them, but you know they're they're the owners. You probably ought to talk to them. You can yeah. tell them I don't want to, I don't agree with anything you say. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, anyway. Yeah. So. When they when they call and you say no, I, I'm ta not taking the call. Uh, yeah. That's, yeah. That's probably not good for the job not, security. Not the best strategy. I yeah. probably I know me or you would have made it very long had that been our strategy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You know. So. But well, anyway, I uh, I really appreciate you coming on, and no, it's uh, been, been, fun. been a blast it's, it's for been, me. It's been really and, fun. And, uh, so, uh, Jim Crandall, uh, a kind of a legend here in uh, Sacramento, and <laughs> I got a lot more years to be a legend. Let's hope. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's hope. hope.